The IRMAC Centre is proud to present the SFU Canada Research Chairs Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts five presentations this semester. For the Spring 2010 semester, the presenters belong to the Faculties of Science, the Faculty of Communication, Art and Technology, and the Faculty of Health Sciences. Today's speaker is Dr. Andrew Feenberg, Canada Research Chair in Philosophy of Technology from the School of Communication. Um, it's my great honor uh, to introduce Andrew Feenberg, um, who's our speaker today. Um, Professor Feenberg uh, is a uh, Canada Research Chair in the Philosophy of Technology and the School of Communication here at Simon Fraser. And he's also the Director of the Applied Communication Lab, uh, Applied Communication and Technology Lab here at SFU. Um, he's been here for six years and he tells me he enjoys it quite a bit. Uh, in our, in our wonderful city. Um, but before coming to SFU, um, he was a, a professor and taught uh, in the philosophy departments at a number of universities, including universities of the US, uh, in France, and Japan. Um, in the 1990s, Professor uh, Feinberg authored three books that uh, established him as one of the leading scholars in the philosophy of technology, um, including Critical Theory of Technology in 1991, um, Alternative Modernity, um, in 1993 and questioning technology in 1999. Um, and I believe that this is the area that he's going to be talking to us uh, about today. What I find uh, most intriguing about uh, Professor Feinberg's work is that not only is he a leading philosopher in this area, um, but his group and his research lab um, considers um, how these technologies uh, impact our lives um, and, and our society. Um, and he does that in a, in a lot of different areas, including online gaming and online learning. So uh, not only is he uh, a philosopher, but he also, uh, in his lab, um, works at a very hands-on level in terms of uh, uh, the technology itself. Without further ado, Professor. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'll present you with a paper. Maybe the lights could go down a little bit in the front of the room so the slides are easier to see. Is that possible? Um, yeah, that's, that's probably right. Not, not too dark or you won't be able to see me. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm going to present a paper here um, that describes a philosophy of technology. It draws on what we have learned in the last 30 years as we abandoned old Heideggerian and positivist notions and faced the real world of technology. It turns out that most of our common sense ideas about technology are wrong. This is why I've put my 10 propositions in the form of paradoxes, although I use the word loosely. These are counterintuitive propositions, but of not formally paradoxes in the logical sense. So the first one is the paradox of the parts and the whole. Let me describe this one for you. Martin Heidegger once asked whether birds fly because they have wings or have wings because they fly. The question seems silly, but it offers an original point of entry for reflection on technology and development. Birds appear to be equipped with wings, and it is this that explains their ability to fly. This is the obvious common sense answer to Heidegger's question. But the answer has implications that are less than obvious. Although our intuitions tell us birds belong in the air, our language seems to say that they are separate from the environment on which they act, and even separate from the equipment they use to cope with the environment. Birds use wings to fly in something like the way in which we humans use airplanes. Pursuing the analogy, we could say that if birds did not have wings, they would be just as earthbound as were humans before the Wright brothers invented the airplane. But this makes no sense. Although there are a few species of flightless birds, most birds could not survive without flying. Flying is not just something birds do. It is their very being. A better analogy to birds' flight would be human speech. Although speechless humans do exist, they lack an essential aspect of what it is to be human. 
Speech is not properly understood as a tool humans use to communicate because without it, they are not fully human. Speech, like flight for birds, is essential in a way that tools are not. One can pick up and put down a tool, but humans can no more abandon speech than birds can abandon flight. Pushed to the extreme, the common sense answer to Heidegger's puzzling question breaks down. Of course, we usually do not fall into such absurdities when talking about animals, but the misleading implications of ordinary language do reflect our inadequate common sense understanding of technology. This has consequences I will discuss in the rest of this paper. Heidegger's second option, that birds have wings because they fly, challenges us in a different way. It seems absurd on the face of it. How can birds fly unless they have wings? So flying cannot be the cause of wings unless an effect can precede a cause. If we're going to make any sense of Heidegger's point, we need to reformulate it in less paradoxical language. Here's what he really means. Birds belong to a specific niche in the environment. That niche consists of treetops in which to dwell, insects to eat, and so on. It is only available to a specific type of animal with a specific type of body. Flying as a necessary property of an organism that occupies this particular niche requires wings rather than the other way around as common sense would have it. This is a holistic conception of the relation of the animal to its environment. We are not to think of birds, insects, and trees as fully separate things, but rather as forming a system in which each relates essentially to the other. But this is not an organic whole, the parts of which are so intimately connected they can only be separated by destroying the organism. In the case of an animal and its niche, separation is possible, at least temporarily, although it threatens the survival of the animal and perhaps of other elements of its environment dependent on it. These relationships are a bit like those of the parts of a machine to the whole machine. The part can be separated from the whole, but then it loses its function. A tire that has been removed from a car continues to be a tire, but it cannot do the things tires are meant to do. Following Heidegger's thought, it is easy to see that the form and even the existence of tires such as we know them depends on the whole car they are destined to serve. And the reciprocal also holds. Car and tire are mutually interdependent. The car is not just assembled from pre-existing parts, since the nature of the parts is derived from the design of the car and vice versa. The car does not ride on the road because it has tires. Rather, the tires belong to the car because the car rides on the road. I will call this the paradox of the parts in the whole. Here it is. The apparent origin of complex wholes lies in their parts. But paradoxical though it seems, in reality, the parts find their origin in the whole to which they belong. I want to illustrate this paradox with two images, each of which exemplifies the two answers to Heidegger's question in graphic terms. The first of these images shows a carburetor in a manufacturer's catalog, the one on, on your left. As you can see, it is a wonder of sharp edged surfaces and smooth curves and cold, shiny steel. It is completely separate from its environment and fulfills the dream of reason, the dream of pure order. Now look at this second image by the painter Walter Murch. We are once again in the presence of a carburetor, but this time it is portrayed as a warm and fuzzy object that blurs into the air around it. It is compared subtly with a sprouting onion over to the left. Do you see the onion? which establishes a scale that contradicts its strangely monumental aspect. This is a romantic rather than a rationalistic image. It hints at the history and the connectedness of the thing rather than emphasizing its engineering perfection. Which image is truer to life? I prefer Murch's, which I used as cover art for a book called Questioning Technology. Murch sets us thinking about technology's complexity questioning it, the environment in which it functions, the history out of which it arises, rather than answering the question in advance with a nod to its supposedly pure rationality. 
Of course, you can see why the manufacturer preferred that picture to this one, but uh, it's not necessarily a good philosophical uh, argument. <laughs> Examples that confirm the point are easy to find. The technology imported or imitated from a developed country is implanted in a new environment in a less developed country. It is expected that it will perform in the same way everywhere. That it is not a local phenomenon bound up with a particular history and environment. In this respect, technologies differ from such rooted phenomena as customs or language. Difficult though it be to transfer Western industrial technology to a poor country, it is far easier than importing such things as a different cuisine or different relations between men and women or a different language. So we say that technology is universal in contrast to these particular and local features. And this is usually correct to a considerable extent. Of course, it makes no sense to send tractors to farmers who have no access to gasoline. Such gross mistakes are occasionally made. But for mo the most part, the problems are more subtle and are often overlooked for a long time. For example, Industrial pollutants that were evacuated safely by a good sewage system in a rich country may poison wells in a new, much poorer locale. Differences in culture to pose problems. The keyboards of the typewriters and computers Japan imported from the West could not represent its written language. Before a technical adaptation was found, some Japanese concluded that modernization would require the adoption of English. Good sewage systems and Roman alphabets form a niche essential to the proper functioning of these technologies, just like the water in which fish swim. Technologies resemble animals in belonging to a specific niche in a specific society. They do not work well, if at all, outside that context. But the fact that technologies can be detached from their appropriate niche means they can be imported without bringing along all the contextual net elements necessary for their proper functioning. Technologies can be plucked from the environment in which they originated and dropped into a new environment without afterthoughts. But this can be a formula for disaster. Consider the adoption of the private automobile by China as a primary means of transportation. In February 2009, auto sales in China surpassed those in the United States for the first time. China is now the largest market for private cars in the world. This is not surprising given the size of China's population. But that very, for that very reason, it was foolish to commit so many resources to the automobile. Automobiles are a very inefficient means of transportation. They consume a great deal of fuel for every passenger mile driven. China is so big that its participation in oil markets will eventually push the price of oil up to the point where the private automobile will be unaffordable to operate. Meanwhile, China will have built its cities around automotive transportation with consequences that can be very expensive to reverse. Mistakes such as this occur because policymakers fail to realize the dependence of the parts on the whole. In this, they resemble ordinary people everywhere in modern societies. Our common sense misleads us into imagining that technologies can stand alone. So why do we think like this? Here's our second paradox. Why does common sense tend to validate the first of the two images I have presented? I find the answer to these questions in another paradox, which I will call the paradox of the obvious. Here is a general formulation. What is most obvious is most hidden. An amusing corollary dramatizes the point. Fish do not know that they are wet. Now, I may be wrong about fish, but I suspect that the last thing they think about is the medium of their existence, water, the niche to which they are so perfectly adapted. A fish out of water quickly dies, but it is difficult to imagine fish enjoying a bath. Water is what fish take for granted, just as we humans take air for granted. We know that we are wet because water is not our natural element. It exists for us in contrast to air. But like fish who do not know they are wet, we do not think about the air we breathe. 
We have many other experiences in which the obvious withdraws from view. For example, when we watch a movie, we quickly lose sight of the screen as a screen. We forget that all the action takes place in the same spot at a certain distance in front of us on a flat surface. A spectator, unable to ignore the obvious, would fail to foreground the action of the film and would remain disturbingly conscious of the screen. The medium recedes into the background, and what we notice in the foreground are the effects it makes possible. This explains why we see the possession of wings as the adequate explanation of flying, and why it looks to us like machines are composed of independent parts. I just had an experience with a screen that rem this reminds me of. If you go to Avatar and watch it in 3D, you'll observe the following peculiar fact about what you're seeing. In this room, if I look at something close and then look at something far, my eye, the focus of my eye adjusts instantly and I'm not aware that while I'm looking at this, you're out of focus and vice versa. But when you are watching Avatar, the 3D images are fixed. Your eye can't change the focus of the background. So at first, you tend to look, you see what's that in the background, but it stays just as blurry. And suddenly you're reminded that you're watching a screen that it isn't real. Yeah, even, um, even though if you just stick, keep your eyes in the foreground, it really does look quite real. Okay, so this brings us then to a third paradox, which I'll call the paradox of the origin. Too bad you can't quite make out what's in the background. It's a, it says exit in the background. It's that sign. The paradox of the origin. Our forgetfulness also blinds us to the history of technical objects. These objects differ from ordinary things and people in the way they relate to time. This person, that book, the tree behind our house all have a past. And that past can be read on his wrinkled and smiling face, the dog-eared pages of the book, the stump of the branch that broke from the tree in the last storm. In such cases, the presence of the past in the present seems to us unremarkable. But technologies seem disconnected from their past. We usually have no idea where they came from, how they developed, the conditions under which the decisions were made that determined their features. They seem self-sufficient in their rational functioning. An adequate explanation of any given device appears to consist in tracing the causal connections between its parts. In reality, there is just as much history to an electric toaster or a nuclear power plant as there is to persons, books, and trees. No device emerged full-blown from the logic of its functioning. Every process of development is fraught with contingencies, choices, alternative possibilities. The perfecting of the technical object obliterates the traces of the labor of its construction and the social forces that were in play as its design was fixed. It is this process that adjusts the object to its niche, and so the occlusion of its history contributes to the forgetfulness of the whole to which it belongs. I call this the paradox of the origin. Behind everything rational, there lies a forgotten history. Here is an example with which we are all familiar. What could be more rational than the lighted exit signs and outward opening doors in theaters? Yet in the United States, these simple life-saving devices were not mandated by any law or regulation until the famous Iroquois Theater fire in Chicago in 1903. Some 600 people died trying to find and get out of the exits. Thereafter, cities all over the country introduced strict safety regulations. Today, we do not take much notice of exit signs and doors, and certainly few theater goers have an idea of their origin. I suspect that none of you knew about the Iroquois theater fire of 1903. Um, I didn't either until I looked it up. We think, if we think at all, that, they are sh that exit signs are surely there as a useful precaution. But the history shows that this is not the full explanation. A contingent fact, a particular incident, lies behind the logic of theater design. So there is a corollary of the paradox of the origin. I call this fourth paradox the paradox of the frame and formulate it as follows. Efficiency does not explain success. Success explains efficiency. This is counterintuitive. 
Our common sense tells us that technologies succeed because they are good at doing their job. Efficiency is the measure of their worth and explains why they are chosen from among the many possible alternatives. But the history of technology tells a different story. Often at the beginning of a line of development, none of the alternatives work very well by the standards of a later time when one of them has enjoyed many generations of innovation and improvement. When we look back from the standpoint of the improved device, we are fooled into thinking its obvious superiority explains its success. But that superiority results from the original choice that privileged the successful technology over the alternatives and not vice versa. So what does explain that choice? Why do we ride bicycles with two wheels the same size instead of weird things like that? Again, the history of technology helps. It shows that many different criteria are applied by the social actors who have the power to make the choice. Sometimes economic criteria prevail, sometimes technical criteria, such as the fit of the device with other technologies in the environment, sometimes social or political requirements of one sort or another. In other words, there is no general rule under which the paths of development can be explained. Explanation by efficiency is a little like explaining the presence of pictures in a museum by the fact that they all have frames. Of course, all technologies must be more or less efficient, but that does not explain why they are present in our technical environment. In each case, only a study of the contingent circumstances of success and failure tells the true story. This brings me to my fifth paradox, which I call the paradox of action. I think of this as a metaphoric corollary of Newton's third law. Newton's law states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. This law is verified every time two billiard balls bounce off each other. My corollary applies this model to human behavior. It, is, it most obviously applies in interpersonal relations, where anger evokes anger, kindness, kindness, and so on. Every one of our acts returns to us in some form as feedback from the other. But this means that in acting, we become the object of action. In more formal philosophical language, the paradox of action says that human beings can only act on a system to which they belong. Because we belong to the system, any change we make in it affects us too. This is the practical significance of our existence as embodied and social beings. Through our body and our social belonging, we participate in a world of causal powers and meanings we do not fully control. We are exposed through our body to the laws of nature, and we are born into a cultural world we largely take as given. In short, we are finite beings. Our finitude shows up in the Newtonian reciprocity of action and reaction. But technical action appears to be non-Newtonian, an exception to the rule of reciprocity. When we act technically on an object, there seems to be very little feedback to us, certainly nothing proportionate to our impact on the object. But this is an illusion, the illusion of technique. It blinds us to three reciprocities of technical action. These are causal side effects of technology, changes in the meaning of our world, and changes in our identity. It is only when we narrowly define the relevant zone of action that we appear to be independent of the objects on which we act. In context, technical action always conforms to my version of Newton's law and comes back to affect the actor. The illusion of independence arises from the nature of technical action, which dissipates or defers causal feedback from the object. Indeed, the whole point of technology is to change the world more than the actor. It is no accident that the gun harms the rabbit, but not the hunter. That the hammer transforms the stack of lumber, but not the carpenter. Tools are designed to focus power outward on the world while protecting the tool user from that equal and opposite reaction Newton proclaimed. But Newton cannot be defied for long. In one way or another, the reaction will manifest itself. In the case of pollution, all one need do to identify the reaction is to enlarge the context in time and space and wait for the chickens to come home to roost. 
Barry Commoner's ecological corollary of Newton's law declares that, quote, everything goes somewhere, end quote. In other words, all the poisons introduced uh, by industry are going to end up in someone's backyard, even if it takes years to notice. As technology grows more powerful, its negative side effects become more difficult to avoid. And finally, it is impossible to ignore the dangers they create. This observation brings us back to our first three paradoxes. The paradox of the parts in the whole states the importance of niche or context. That niche must include a way of absorbing the impact of the technology, including its waste products. But attention to this aspect of technology is obscured by a narrow conception of technical action. The paradox of the obvious works against recognizing this connection. The feedback that is invisible in the immediate zone of action becomes visible when a wider or longer range view is available. The paradox of the origin wipes the slate clean and obscures the history in which past feedback influenced current designs. In modern society, technologies are perceived as purely instrumental and separate from their past. The also and separate from their past and from the environment in which they function and their operator, like those wings that cause birds to fly. But these apparent separations hide essential aspects of technology as we have seen. I have called this principle the illusion of technology. This illusion is less of a problem in traditional societies. Their craft knowledge and everyday experience are in constant communication. The lessons learned from using technical devices are absorbed into the craft tradition where they limit and control technical activity. From a modern standpoint, this appears to be an obstacle to development, but there may be wisdom in restraint. Certainly, our recent experience with technologies such as nuclear weapons and toxic chemicals indicate a need for restraint. But this is not the way most technology in modern societies has developed. Under capitalism, Control of technology is no longer in the hands of craftsmen, but is transferred to the owners of enterprise. Capitalist enterprise is unusual among social institutions in having a very narrow goal, profit, and the freedom to pursue that goal without regard for consequences. Once technology has been delivered over to such an institution, the lessons of experience are ignored. Workers, users of technology, victims of its side effects, all are silenced throughout the industrialization process. Technological development can proceed without regard for the more remote aspects of its own context. This makes possible the development of sophisticated technical disciplines and very rapid progress, but with unfortunate side effects. In communist countries, this same pattern prevailed under government control, where the goal assigned to state enterprises, meeting a quota, was similarly narrow. Instead of correcting the illusion of technology, modern societies take that illusion for reality. They imagine they can act on the world without consequences for themselves. But only God can act on objects from outside the world, outside the system on which he acts. All human action, including technical action, exposes the actor. The illusion of godlike power is dangerous. When Robert Oppenheimer witnessed the explosion of the first atom bomb, a quotation from the Bhagavad Gita flashed through his mind. Here's the quote, I have become death, the shatterer of worlds. But soon he was attempting to negotiate disarmament with Moscow. He realized that the shatterer could be shattered. Presumably Shiva, the god of death, does not have to worry about the Russians. Our actions not only come back to us through causal feedback, they also change the meaning of our world. The most dramatic examples of such transformations of meaning occur around new technologies of transportation and communication. Railroads and later automobiles and airplanes have radically diminished the experience of distance. Regions once remote were suddenly made close by these technologies. The spatial coordinates of our lives, what we mean by far and near, are completely different from what it was for all humanity throughout previous history. Added to these changes, electronic communication has radical consequences 
as a multicultural world gradually emerges from the monocultures of old. Ordinary people now know more about foreign lands and cultures from movies, encounters with immigrants, and tourism than all but a few adventurers and colonial administrators a century ago. What is more, such familiar distinctions as those between public and private, work and home, are subverted as new technology brings the office into the domestic space and extrudes creative activities and private fantasies into public arenas. Even the meaning of nature is subject to technological transformation. Take amniocentesis, for example. It allows the sex of the fetus to be identified early in pregnancy. Relatively few parents abort fetuses because of their sex, but the fact that they can do so at all transforms an act of God into a human choice. What formerly was a matter of luck can now be planned. Even choosing not to use the information has become a choice in favor of nature, whereas before, no choice was involved. You had to have names for both a boy and a girl. Our society is now capable of technologizing reproduction and has thus changed its meaning for everyone, even for those who do not use the technology. Okay, so this leads me to another paradox. The paradox of action also holds in the case of identity. The hunter kills a rabbit with his gun and all he feels is a little pressure from the kickback of the weapon, but the rabbit is dead. There is an obvious disproportion between the effect of the action on the actor and his object, but the action does have significant consequences for the hunter. His identity is determined by his acts. That is to say, he is a hunter insofar as he hunts. This reverse action of technology on identity is true of everyone's productive activity. In sum, you are what you do. Consumer society has brought the question of identity to the fore in another way. The technologies we use in daily life, such as automobiles, iPods, mobile phones, signify us as the kind of people we are. We now wear our technologies just as we wear clothes, jewelry, and other forms of self-presentation. Today, not only are you what you do, but even more emphatically, you are what you use. These observations suggest a sixth paradox of the means, which follows directly from the paradox of action. And here's the formulation. The means are the end. There is a weaker version of this paradox with which everyone is familiar. It is obvious that means and ends are not completely separate. Common sense tells us not to expect much good to come from using bad means even if the ends we have in view are benign. But my formulation is more radical. The point is not that means and ends are related, but they are in fact one and the same over a wide range of technological issues. By this I mean that the changes in meaning and identity discussed above are often the most important effect of technological change and not its ostensible purpose. Consider the example of the automobile again. Automobile ownership involves far more than transportation. It symbolizes the owner's status. In poor countries, it has an even greater symbolic charge than in rich ones, signifying the achievement of modernity and its vision of a rich and fulfilling life. You'll be interested to know that the Hummer belonged to General Motors before General Motors went bankrupt. And when they went bankrupt, guess who they sold it to? A Chinese company. So, it cannot be said that in such cases, means and ends are separate. Possession of the means is already an end in itself because identity is at stake in the relation to technology. This brings me to a seventh paradox of complexity which can be succinctly stated as simplification complicates. This corollary of the paradox of action flows from the nature of technology. As we have seen, technologies can be removed from their context and transferred to alien locales. But more profoundly considered, technology is in some sense already decontextualized even before it is transferred, even in its normal setting. By this I mean that creating a technology involves abstracting 
the useful aspects of materials from their natural connections. This constitutes a radical simplification of those materials, so radical, in fact, that it must be compensated by a recontextualization in a new technological niche where we find them transformed in a finished and working device. But the recontextualization is not always completely successful. Here's an example. To make the paper on which this lecture is printed, trees were removed from their place in the ecology of the forest as they were reduced to simplified raw materials. They were then transformed to become useful in a new context, the context of contemporary writing practices. That new context brought with it all sorts of constraints, such as size, thickness, compatibility with current printers, and so on. We recognize the paper as belonging to this new context. But the process of decontextualizing and recontextualizing technical objects sometimes results in unexpected problems. In the case in point, paper making employs dangerous chemicals, and its poorly regulated pursuit causes air pollution and harm to rivers and their inhabitants. That's an example. In sum, in simplifying, technological projects such as paper making produce new complications. This is why context matters. Ignorance of context is especially prevalent in developing countries that receive a great deal of transferred technology. Blindness to the context and consequences is the rule in such cases. Technologies adapted to one world disrupt another world. These complications become the occasion for popular reactions and protests as they impinge on the health and well-being of ordinary people. This proposition is tested over and over in one developing society after another. We frequently read now about riots in China over pollution problems. Where popular reaction leads to correctives, sorry, where popular reaction leading to correctives is effectively suppressed, as it was in the Soviet Union, the consequences of development can be catastrophic. Severe chemical pollution of the air, water, and soil, extensive radioactive contamination, and declining fertility and life expectancy. As it grows more powerful and pervasive, technology becomes more and more difficult to insulate uh, from, I'm sorry, as it grows more powerful and pervasive, it becomes more and more difficult to insulate technology from feedback from the underlying population. Workers, users, victims, and potential victims all have their say at some point. Their feedback, provoked by maladaptation, negative side effects, or unrealized technical potential, leads to interventions that constrain development and orient its path. Once mobilized to protect themselves, protesters attempt to impose the lessons of experience with technologies on the technical experts who possess the knowledge necessary to build working devices in a modern society. It appears superficially that two separate things, technical knowledge and everyday experience, interact in a clash of opposites. Technical experts sometimes decry what they think of as ideological interference with their pure and objective knowledge of nature. They protest that values and desires must not be allowed to muddy the waters of fact and truth. Protesters may make the corresponding error and denounce the experts in general, while nevertheless employing their technology constantly in everyday life. I'm used to this from people who study the internet, as I do, and who take airplanes to conferences where they denounce technology. But in fact, technical knowledge and experience are complementary rather than opposed. Technical knowledge is incomplete without the input from experience that corrects its oversights and simplifications. Public protests indirectly reveal the complications unintentionally caused by those simplifications. For example, aspects of nature so far overlooked by the experts. Protests work by formulating values and priorities. Demand for such things as safety, health, skilled employment, recreational resources, aesthetically pleasing cities, testified to the failure of technology to adequately incorporate all the constraints of its environment. Eventually, those values will be incorporated into improved technical designs, and the conflict between the public and its experts will die down. 
Indeed, in years to come, the technical experts will forget the politics behind the reforms uh, that they made in designs. And when new demands appear, those experts will defend them as a product of pure and objective knowledge of nature. Values cannot enter technology without being translated into technological language. Simply wishing away inconvenient technical limitations will not work. The results of such a voluntaristic approach are disastrous, as the Chinese discovered in the Cultural Revolution. For something useful to come out of public interventions, experts must figure out how to formulate values as viable technical specifications. When that is accomplished, a new version of the contested technologies can be produced that is responsive to its context. In the process, values are translated into technical facts and technology fits more smoothly into its niche. The structure of this process is a consequence of a technology cut off to a considerable extent from the experience of those who live with it and use it. But the experience of users and victims of technology eventually influences the technical codes that preside over design. Early examples emerge in the labor movement around health and safety at work. Later, such issues as food safety and environmental pollution signal the widening circle of affected publics. Today, as we have seen, such interactions are becoming routine and new groups emerge frequently as worlds change in response to technological change. This overall dynamic of technological change closes the circle described in the paradox of action. As we say in Southern California, what goes around comes around. And because we have experience and are capable of reflecting on it, we can change our technologies to safeguard ourselves and to support the new activities they make possible. Sometimes the problem is not the harm technology does, but the good it might do if only it were configured to meet unmet demands. This case is exemplified by the internet. It was created by the US military to test a new type of network computer time sharing. But a graduate student came up with the idea of networking not only the computers, but also the users and introduced email. Since then, one generation of users after another has developed and explored new ideas for social interaction on the internet. Home pages were followed by web forums and web forums by social sites dedicated to music sharing and photography. These sites were integrated into blogs and now social sites such as MySpace and Facebook have emerged pulling together many social resources. At each stage, programmers have worked to accommodate the new demands of users with the corresponding technical solutions. This is a process repeated endlessly as technologies develop. This leads to my eighth paradox, which I will call uh, the paradox of value and fact. Values are the facts of the future. Values are not the opposite of facts, subjective desires with no basis in reality. Values express aspects of reality that have not yet been incorporated into the taken for granted technical environment. That environment was shaped by the values that presided over its creation. Technologies are the crystallized expression of those values. New values open up established technologies for revision. Okay, so this brings us to the ninth paradox. We're reaching the end. Social groups form around the technologies that mediate their relations, make possible their common identity, and shape their experience. We all belong to many such groups. Some are defined social categories, and the salience of technology to their experience is obvious. A worker in a factory, a nurse in a hospital, a truck driver in his truck, are all members of communities that exist through the technologies they employ. Consumers and victims of side effects of technology form latent groups that surface when their members become aware of the shared reasons for their problems. The politics of technology grows out of these technical mediations that underlie the many social groups that make up modern society. Such encounters between the individuals and the technologies that connect them proliferate with consequences of all sorts. Social identities and worlds emerge together 
and form the backbone of modern society. In the technology studies literature, this is called the, the co-construction of technology and society. The examples cited here show this co-construction resulting in ever tighter feedback loops like the drawing hands in M.C. Escher's famous print of that name. And you can see the print behind the text. I want to use this image to discuss the underlying structure of the technology-society relationship. Escher's self-drawing hands are emblematic of the concept of the strange loop or entangled hierarchy introduced by Douglas Hofstadter in his book, Gödel Escher Bach. The strange loop arises when moving up or down a logical hierarchy leads paradoxically back to the starting point. A logical hierarchy in this sense can include a relationship between actors and their objects, such as seeing and being seen, talking and listening. The active side stands at the top of the hierarchy and the passive side at the bottom. In the Escher print, the paradox is illustrated in a visible form. The hierarchy of drawing subject and drawn object is entangled by the fact that each hand plays both functions with respect to the other. If we say that the hand on the right is at the top of the hierarchy, drawing the hand on the left, we come up against the fact that the hand on the left draws the hand on the right, and so is also located at the top level. Thus, neither hand is at the top, or both are, which is contradictory. On Hofstadter's terms, the relation between technology and society is an entangled hierarchy. Insofar as social groups are constituted by the technical links that associate their members, their status is that of the drawn object in Escher's scheme. But they react back on those links in terms of their experience, drawing that which draws them. Once formed and conscious of their identity, technologically mediated groups influence technical design through their choices and protests. This feedback from society to technology constitutes the democratic paradox. And here, here's the formulation. The public is constituted by the technologies that bind it together, but in turn, it transforms the technologies that constitute it. Neither society nor technology can be understood in isolation from each other because neither has a stable identity or form. This paradox is endemic to democracy in general. Self-rule is an entangled hierarchy. As the French revolutionary Saint-Just put it, quote, the people is a submissive monarch and a free subject, end quote. Over the centuries since the democratic paradox was first enacted, its reach has extended from basic political issues of civil order and defense to embrace social issues such as marriage, education, and health care. The process of extending democracy to technology began with the labor movement. It called attention to the contradiction between democratic ideology and the tyranny of the factory. This was the first expression of a politics of technology at a time when technical mediation was still confined to a single sector of society. It's in the 19th century. The dream of control of the economy by those who build it with their brains and hands has never been fully realized. But today, Around the many issues raised by technology, something very like that dream is revived in new forms. Those who demand environmentally compatible production, a medical system more responsive to patient needs, a free and public internet, and many other democratic reforms of technology follow in the footsteps of the socialist movement, whether they know it or not. They are broadening democratic claims to cover the whole social terrain incorporated into the technological system. Hofstadter's scheme has a limitation that, that does not apply in the case of technology. The strange loop is never more than a partial subsy subsystem in a consistent, objectively conceived universe, according to Hofstadter. Hofstadter evades ultimate paradox by positing an inviolate level of strictly hier hierarchical relations above the strange loop that it makes possible. He calls this level inviolate because it is not logically entangled with the entangled hierarchy it creates. In the case of the Escher drawing, the paradox only exists because of the unparadoxical activity of the actual printmaker, Escher. 
who drew it in the ordinary way without himself being drawn by anybody. The notion of an inviolate level has its place in logic, but not in the life of a technological society. In fact, the illusion of technique is precisely defined by this notion. This illusion gives rise to the popular belief that through technology, we conquer nature. But human beings are natural beings, and so the project of conquest is inherently paradoxical. This 10th paradox of conquest was succinctly formulated in another context by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald said, quote, the victor belongs to the spoils, end quote. The conqueror of nature is despoiled by its own violent assault. This paradox has two implications. On the one hand, when humanity conquers nature, it merely arms some human beings with more effective means to exploit and oppress others. Human beings as natural beings are among the conquered subjects. On the other hand, as we have seen, actions that harm the natural environment come back to haunt the perpetrators in the form of pollution or other negative feedback from the system to which both conqueror and conquered belong. In sum, the things we do as a society to nature are also things we do to ourselves. In reality, there is no inviolate level, no equivalent of Escher in the real world of co-construction, no godlike agent creating technology and society from the outside. All the creative activity takes place in a world that is itself created by that activity. Only in our fantasies do we transcend the strange loops of technology and experience. In the real world, there is no escape from the logic of finitude. The 10 paradoxes of technology, 10 paradoxes form a philosophy of technology that is remote from current views, but corresponds more nearly to experiences we have with increasing frequency. In rich countries, the internet and the environment are the two domains in which the paradoxes are most obviously at work. The many disorders of development illustrate their relevance in the rest of the world. Everywhere technology reveals its true complexity as it emerges from the cultural ghetto in which it was confined until recently. Today, technological issues routinely appear on the front pages of the newspapers. Fewer and fewer people imagine they can be left to the experts to decide. This is the occasion for the radical change in our understanding of technology. The institutionalized abstractions of the corporations and the technical professions are no longer the only standpoint from which to understand technology. Now it is more and more in the foreground of our everyday activities and provokes renewed philosophical reflection. Okay, so that's the end. Um, I'd be happy to respond to questions now. And uh, also, if you want to email me to emails, you might find some interesting things on my web page where there's a good deal of material on technology. So first question. All right, any questions? Uh, so we have a mic, um, and we're web streaming this. So if you could use the microphone for this. So I can see. I mean, this is one way to look at these things, like, you know, things that seem separate, but they're together as part of a whole. What I'm, what I'm not seeing is a kind of a, I don't know, a evolutionary approach or idea that would give a sense of where any of, where any of these things are going in terms of certain technologies today. For example, with the birds and their wings, it's, it seems like you could bounce around inside your own head on which uh, the flying or the wings, which is for the ev the other. But if you think of in terms of you know what's advantageous, then it makes sort of a satisfying explanation of why most of the birds around here can fly, and a lot of them in New Zealand uh, lost that ability, you know, for uh, because there weren't the land animals and so on. So, but. I mean, it seems like I'm looking for some kind of an explanation like that in terms of, I don't know, modern biotechnology or something. Where is that going to? Well, we'd like to have that kind of explanation of social events because we are really happy to have that kind of explanation of 
ge geological or biological events. But, um, that's why I had a slide showing complexity. Uh, I'm not sure that we can really expect that kind of explanation in the case of social evolution. Bec we have to tell the story. It's history rather than natural science. We have to tell the story to find out what contingent circumstances uh, oriented development. So for example, the whole development of production technology from the 19th century down to the present has been oriented by the problems of maintaining control of production in capitalist enterprise. It might look quite different had guilds somehow transformed themselves into collective owners of manufacturing and workers controlled cho technological choices from the very beginning. That's a, that's a phenomenon in, the, in society, right? It's not a technological matter, it's a social matter which comes to influence uh, the course, the path of technological development. And I think that's generally the case. The recent explosion of study in, te uh, in sociology and history of technology seems to show everywhere we're finding contingent uh, causes in non-technical domains that oriented the decisions made about technology. That's why I didn't offer such an explanation. Are there any other questions? Uh, thank you for your talk. I, I really appreciated the uh, framing of these issues in terms of the paradox. I think it encapsulates quite a few really significant um, implications. The one that the paradox that I deal with every day in in my own area of research and technology is the one that uh, we seem to have opposing effects of technology. One that simplifies and degrades uh, a previous pro uh, process, and one that extends and uh, seems to lead us into new territories, right, of human experience or perception and perhaps social implication. So I wondered, I keep wondering if there's a relationship between that formulation that I just gave and the formulations you gave, if they relate to it or extend it or just simply could be subsumed by some of your paradoxes. <laughs> Stopped at 10. <laughs> Would you like 11? <laughs> I, I started with three, I think, and it gradually grew. And then I, when I reached 10, I figured, no, it's, that's it. Um, but that is, a, that is ob obviously another kind of paradox. I'm not sure how to subsume it. You could say that it's part of the simplification complicates, right? It's, a, it's not, the, not a bad effect, but a good effect of complication. And I could incorporate it there. Um, because it is true that, um, that often simplifying, for example, the internet, we all use it to communicate. The communication process simplifies us. We no longer present ourselves in our clothes and you know, tone of voice and so on. We just present a little text. That's a radical simplification, which complicates in an interesting way, not in a bad way. It makes it possible to maintain contact with people all over the world. And, so on. So yeah, that could, could fit there. I was thinking, because you were here, that there is still a lot of craft technology, especially in domains like music. And the communication between the technical experts and the uh, experience of people who use technology is still very close. Very, it's very different from what happens in the industrial sector. Just unfortunately, does not structure our social world to the same extent that industry does. Are there any other questions? No. If not, uh, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you, Professor Greenberg.